Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to Dr. Banshi and the organizers of DiacareCon for inviting us to the event. So it's wonderful to spend the Sunday uh, with all of you here today. Uh, so we've got this whole session on advances in pain management, advances in blood pressure control. Uh, I don't know what that was. And now advances, um, we're going to look at the advanced study and uh, look at what we can take away from that with respect to blood glucose management. Now, uh, the first thing when we look at any study is uh, a few questions that we ask ourselves. Uh, who are the people included in the study? Uh, do we see the si same kind of patients in my practice? Because that is uh, what you need to see. And then based on the results of the study, you would know if you could apply the same kind of results, if you can expect to see the same kind of uh, clinical effectiveness when you use a certain molecule uh, in your practice. Uh, so that is what we're trying to look at um, at the end of this talk. Now, we know from several studies that uh, early aggressive glucose control is important. And now what the UK PDS told us was that uh, reduction in blood glucose levels in A1C translates to microvascular outcomes. Uh, translation to macrovascular uh, benefits was not really seen initially, but it was seen in the follow-up. So it took a much really longer time. But it left us with one lingering question, which was, how intensively lower can we go? And what happens if we get to a A1C? less than seven, say 6.5. And that was the objective of the advanced study. So they were trying to ask the question, what happens if we do intensive glycemic control in the group of patients to get them to A1C below 6.5? And then in another group, just do conventional uh, management. And uh, these were all patients with type two diabetes at different levels of blood glucose levels, but they were not patients taking insulin. So they were all patients on oral anti-diabetic medication. Now, the study included close to 11,000 individuals, and uh, 470 of them were from India. Uh, the average age was uh, 55 years, and they were patients with type 2 diabetes on OADs. Um, so the mean A1C at the enrollment of the study was 7.5%. Now, many of these individuals already had a history of a vascular event, or they had risk factors to th that could predispose them to a vascular disease in the future. Now, what happened to the glycemic control? In the intensive arm, compared to the standard of care arm, uh, the intensive arm reached their target of 6.5. So that was what they wanted, and they reached that arm. And uh, the intensive arm, the, the A1C dropped in people irrespective of the baseline BMI irrespective of their age and irrespective of the duration of diabetes. So at whatever duration of diabetes, age, or BMI the patient fell, whichever category the patient fell into, uh, everyone in the intensive arm could achieve the A1C of 6.5. So what was used again to get to this intensive control? It was uh, extended release glycoside. So that was the molecule used to get patients to the A1C of 6.5 in this particular study. Now, but this was not, of course, the primary endpoint. What was the try study trying to see? When I use modified uh, or extended release glycoside in patients to get them to A1C of 6.5, what happens to the overall vascular event? So the combined major and uh, ma major macro and microvascular events. So at the end of the study, which was a five-year follow-up, uh, the study reached its goal. So there was a 10% reduction in combined events in the intensively controlled arm compared to the standard of care arm. And a lot of this benefit was actually seen due to improvement in renal outcomes. So yes, there was an improvement in overall microvascular outcomes, CV death, total mortality, and also in macrovascular outcomes. But the biggest change and the benefit driving this overall, uh, the biggest uh, change that drove this benefit was the improvement in renal outcomes. And this was all just with five years of intensive control. So there was a reduction in new onset microalbuminuria, a reduction in new or worsening of nephropathy, and reduction of new onset macroalbuminuria. So what we learned from this at this point of time was we can get to intensive control, get patients to 6.5 and C using this particular molecule, and there is an overall benefit on micro and macrovascular outcomes, and there's a much greater benefit on kidney disease outcomes. What we also take away is that getting to intensive control did not increase the risk of cardiovascular events because that is, again, something we're uh, traditionally worried about, that getting patients to too tight control, too strict control may increase the risk of 
uh, cardiac disease, and that did not happen. So there was overall benefit in all micro-macro outcomes, a greater benefit in kidney outcomes, no increase in uh, CV events. Now, there was a reduction in end-stage renal disease by, all, by about 65%, a reduction in uh, relative risk in the intensive control arm, and reduction in all the different outcomes related to the kidney. There was also improvement in progression parameters. So it was not just prevention of new onset kidney disease. People already had macro or microalbuminuria. They could regress. And people who did not, the progression was much, much lesser. So there was a reduction in new onset micro and macroalbuminuria. And there was regression of nephropathy by more than one stage uh, in about 15% of the patients. And regression to normal albuminuria in 20% of the patients in the intensive arm with glycolyzide. So what was the number needed to treat? In the overall study population of all the people, healthy and those with uh, vascular disease, the number needed to treat was 400 plus. But in those who already had pre-existing kidney disease, so micro or macroalbuminuria, or just macroalbuminuria, treating them to target uh, 6.5 made a bigger, bigger difference. So in those who already had macroalbuminuria, the number needed to treat to prevent one end-stage renal disease was just 41. So treating even a very small number of patients over five years, getting them to control and making sure that they stay at control, we can prevent uh, renal events in our patients as well. So that's how we would translate that if we have to use this evidence in our practice. But that's not the end, right? Because we see patients for much longer. It doesn't end at five years. So what happened later on? Uh, so the advanced on study continued to follow up all these individuals. And then some patients were lost to follow up. So from 11,000, you see the numbers came to about 9,000 in the end, 4, 4,000 approximately in each group. And uh, then these individuals were followed up for another total of almost 10 years. Now, in this follow-up time, uh, even though initially they were randomized to intensive and standard of care arm, at this point of time, the HbA1c curves were kind of matching, and there was no difference in the glucose control. But what happened to the renal outcomes? Uh, what we see is that the initial benefit that was seen in reduction of end-stage renal disease persisted uh, even in the at the end of the follow-up of 10 years, and there was a relative risk reduction of almost 50% in those who had initially got uh, intensive control with liclozide. This benefit was greater in people who had no CKD and people who had early CKD like stage 1, stage 2. Not so much of a difference was seen in those who had advanced uh, end-stage renal disease. So maybe there was some threshold that patients were crossing after which it was not making too much of a difference. Now, irrespective of what level of uh, kidney disease the patient had, there was an improvement in the A1C level. So whether their GFR was more than 90, 60 to 90, or under 90, all those in the intensive control arm responded better. Irrespective of the GFR subgroup that the, or the level of kidney disease that the patient was in, there was no difference in the overall benefit. So no, we know from the uh, results of the study that there was a benefit in micro and macrovascular outcomes, and this did not change based on baseline variables like the GFR, and uh, no, there was no change in CV death, all-cause death, or major coronary events based on the GFR levels. There was also no change in the worsening of new onset nephropathy based on the baseline eGFR levels, or based on the UACR levels or the KD go risk score. So we'll not look at the numbers and all these figures too much. What we take away from this is irrespective of uh, which level of kidney disease the patient has or what level of UACR or GFR the patient has, if we get them to intensive control, there can be a benefit in long-term progression of kidney disease. So we could maybe stop it somewhere in between. We could maybe even regress it in a certain number of patients. Now, does this change based on the baseline ASCV deals? So we know that uh, the overall benefit does not change based on the level of kidney function. So we just looked at that. So does the uh, change, is there a change based on the baseline ASCV deals? And this is what a subsequent subgroup analysis actually uh, told us, that irrespective of how you classify the patients as ASCV deals below 20, 20 to 40, or more than 40, there was no overall change in the benefit seen with intensive control. 
So don't worry about the numbers, but look here, uh, you see major vascular events, macrovascular events, and microvascular events. So all the overall benefits that you see with intensive control, getting patients down to A1C of 6.5, we expect to see the same benefit irrespective of whether the patient has cardiovascular disease or not. So what I'm trying to say is in another way, there's no increased risk of cardiac events in patients who get to intensive control with liclozide, and that's from the data of the advanced study. Now, this is again another slide which is depicting exactly the same that you saw in numbers in the previous slide. So irrespective of where the patients, oh sorry, so this is slightly different. So irrespective of what the patient's A1C is, uh, we see an improvement in the macro and microvascular events. So there's no change based on the baseline A1C. There's no change based on the baseline ASCVD risk score. So we expect to see the same kind of benefit irrespective of patient's BMI, irrespective of patient's age, uh, irrespective of patient's baseline A1C levels, irrespective of patient's baseline kidney function and cardiac risk. So what do we learn from all this data that we've got over the years uh, from the advanced trial? That intensive control, getting patients to goal is important. We know that getting them to goal early is uh, probably necessary and it can prevent uh, long-term damage. Now, this study told us that the greatest benefit uh, was actually in terms of improving renal outcomes. So that is something to keep in mind. So it, it prevented a progression of nephropathy, helped in regression of nephropathy, and this benefit can persist even if the patient subsequently has poor control uh, sometime later in their life. But of course, we don't want our patients to have that. The other thing that we take away from all the different subgroup analysis is that whatever their baseline A1C may be, whatever their baseline EGFR may be, or cardiac risk may be, we could hopefully um, expect to see the same kind of benefits in terms of renal and CV outcomes um, in our patients when we treat them to target uh, using this particular molecule. Now, uh, why we looked at the advanced study? Because it represents a lot of patients whom we see in clinical practice. Uh, patients on, with diabetes, different duration, on OADs. This study didn't include patients on insulin, but I would say even patients on insulin, getting them to goal is obviously necessary. So it's not that we would treat them differently. Um, modified release glycolyzide, remember, is a, is a modern sulfonylurea, so risk of hypoglycemia is lesser. CV safety um, uh, is not an issue compared to glibenclamide. So wherever possible, do use a modern sulfonylurea for management when you need to use SUs uh, for treatment. Again, uh, SUs do not cause beta cell exhaustion. We use SUs in practice for years, even when patients are on insulin. Otherwise, the dose of insulin goes up by you know, 3x or 5x. And patient who could just take a basal insulin ends up on three injections a day when we take away the SU. So this is not a part of the study, but please do uh, consider using SUs when you do initiate patients on insulin as well. So I think those are the takeaways from the advanced study, but basically get them to goal, get them to strict uh, targets, and avoid hypo as much as possible. And we can expect to see the same kind of long-term benefits and prevent complications in our patients also. So thank you very much.